Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Berkeley Center for New Media's Arts, Technology, and Culture Colloquium. Just so you know, tonight's speaker, Professor Margarita Kulova, and I are in the same room. So when she appears, our, our backgrounds will look identical. I just didn't want to confuse anyone. Uh, my name is Gail DeCosmic, and I'm an Associate Professor of New Media and Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. And I'm also the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we call BCNM. BCNM is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. Through critical thinking and making, we cultivate technological fairness and equity in our classrooms, in our communities, and on the internet. Our Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium, founded in 1997 by Professor Ken Goldberg, is an internationally respected forum for creative ideas. Free and open to the public, it presents leading artists, writers, and critical thinkers who question assumptions and push boundaries at the forefront of multiple intersecting fields. BCNM is committed to promoting technological equity and justice. As such, our free events are inclusive, respectful, and harassment-free spaces. We invite everyone to participate by responding to tonight's lecture in the chat or in the Q&A portion and ask that attendees help us maintain a respectful space. Attendees who violate our guidelines will be removed from the event and may be disallowed from future online events. If you are new to our events, welcome. We will share a link to our community agreements in the chat. I would now like to take a moment to honor the land. We recognize that Berkeley is located in the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chechenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the Confederated Villages of Lashan. The history of prolific technological development in this region has always depended on this land, and all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place on and in relation to this land. We commit to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationships with tribal leaders and organizations. I would also like to honor the Wadai peoples of Leyte Island and the Luma peoples of Mindanao Island in the Philippines, my homeland, and the Tongva peoples of Shuangna, place of the Russians, now called Lomita, California, where I grew up, and also the Ramaytush Ohlone tribe in whose Aboriginal homeland I now reside in what is called the city and county of San Francisco. Before introducing tonight's speaker, I want to say that the Berkeley Center for New Media expresses solidarity with and support for the nation and people of Ukraine who have been defending themselves against incursions by Russia ordered by Vladimir Putin for the past eight years with the conflict escalating into open warfare in many regions of Ukraine three weeks ago. We will put a link in the chat to top rated charities providing aid in Ukraine assembled by the nonprofit organization Charity Watch. BCNM also supports the Russian anti-war movement. Russia's war against Ukraine is not called for or endorsed by many citizens of Russia, and we encourage everyone on this call to not conflate the actions of Russia's leader with the wishes or beliefs of its citizens. Now on to tonight's event. This event has been long delayed. I first issued an invitation to Rita three years ago, and we planned for her to come to Berkeley in spring 2020, which was canceled, of course, due to the first year of the COVID pandemic, and then canceled again in spring 2021. Finally, Rita was able to arrive in the Bay Area after barely managing to exit St. Petersburg under strenuous conditions. I'm very grateful that she was able to arrive safely at last. I did not initially invite Rita alone. I, in 2019, I issued an invitation to Rita and to one of her mentors, the brilliant professor Natalia Samutina, who sadly passed away last February after a long battle with cancer. Natalia was on faculty at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow and was head of the Research Center for Contemporary Culture. In 2016, Natalia convened a fantastic international conference called Challenges of Participatory Cultures in Moscow, uh, to which she invited me to speak. At that conference, I engaged in fabulous cross-cultural and cross-disciplinary conversations with Rita and other scholars from Russia, as well as researchers from the Netherlands, Sweden, and the UK. 
That event and its participants will always remain close to my heart as an exemplar of the value and importance of international research exchanges, thanks to Natalia's brilliant creation and flawless organizational work. Natalia, all of your fans down here miss you. We dedicate tonight's event to you in memoriam. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Professor Margarita Kulova, with generous co-sponsorship from the Department of Slavic Languages, the Department of the History of Art, the Arts Research Center, the Doreen B. Townsend Center for the Humanities, and Berkeley Arts Plus Design. Margarita Kulova is a PhD uh, who received her BA in Liberal Arts from Smolny College, the joint program of St. Petersburg State University in Russia and Bard College in New York. She graduated with an MA in Sociology from the Higher School of Economics. Currently, she works as a senior lecturer at the National Research University Higher School of Economics in St. Petersburg, where she holds the position of chair of the Department of Design and Contemporary Art. She also is a fellow of the Center for German and European Studies at St. Petersburg State University, University of Bielefeld, and the Center for Art, Design, and Social Research. Rita has collaborated as a researcher and curator with a number of Russian and international cultural institutions, including Manifesta Biennale, Garage Mocha, Goethe Institute, Street Art Museum, Ural Industrial Biennale, and New Holland, St. Petersburg. One of her main in research interests is creative labor. She also adopts a network approach and feminist theory to the sociology of art um, and clothing consumption and fashion production. In 2012 to 2016, she studied post-Soviet creativity, looking at the example of the careers and professional identities of young cultural workers in the hybrid cultural economy in Russia. Some findings from these studies are presented in recent journal publications, such as the Journal of Cultural Studies uh, and the International Journal of Cultural Studies. Please welcome Rita to BCNN. Thank you, Gail, for this fantastic introduction. And uh, I mean, it says nothing, like if I just mentioned that I'm happy to be here. And uh, it was a long way and uh, it's hard to me, for me to talk at the moment because the war in Ukraine is a devastating situation and it's a crime against uh, humanity. But I think that we need to keep together for future peace and uh, dialogue and, and, and stay together even though it, it's hard to uh, express very complicated and, and um, um, mixed feelings because yeah, the heart is broken. But um, I, I hope I can share some thoughts on uh, not just on um, the current situation, but I hope that my research can be um, an introduction to um, very um, distinct and decent forms of culture that are present in Russia and uh, the post-Soviet space. And uh, um, Gail said all the right things, I think already, but I, from me uh, personally, I, I want to repeat that uh, this event uh, is dedicated to memory of Natalia Simutina. She was a very important friend and, and colleague. And uh, though she is not here for this, um, yeah, um, I, I hope that, that I can uh, give a little bit of um, uh, presentation of, of her perspective and uh, the plan talk was called uh, Invisible Russia, as I, I remember, and uh, I hope together we can give uh, a little bit of visibility and, and voice for many brave courageous, uh, in, in many ways, uh, cultural producers that are present in Russia and um, Russian-speaking world. Uh, so I try to share my presentation. Uh, we did a little rehearsal of that, and I hope that still works, and Gail can just, yeah, yeah, it, it is work. Uh, in operation. So the talk, as Gail also mentioned, <laughs> um, uh, called uh, the, the right to be creative. And um, uh, here, um, 
you can see uh, the picture that needs to be also updated. So that's uh, um, previous edition of Benny's uh, Biennale, and um, uh, that's one of um, the works of Shishkin Hokusai. And here I think beautifully uh, coexist three things. Um, one is um, um, cultural uh, heritage. Uh, here we see um, some um, resemblance of, of Rembrandt, which is uh, largely presented uh, in uh, the state hermitage. Uh, we can see some technological innovation and uh, uh, we can see oppression and a little um, uh, female character also given by Shishkin Hokusai. And I, I, think, I think that uh, this picture still works. Uh, for my uh, presentation and these uh, associations I plan to unfold uh, a little bit later. So I would start actually with um, um, the, concept, the context which is all familiar. So I, I want to uh, speak on um, risks and struggles of um, creative workers of Russia uh, and beyond. And um, um, so, um, as I said, the talk uh, is um, a result of um, 10 years of uh, my studies of um, um, cultural workers. Today, we mainly present the Russian part, but huge part of it was a comparative study with the UK-based uh, cultural workers. Uh, but I want to start, when, when we talk about risks, uh, I first man, want to mention the, the most obvious that uh, risk of, of losing life and, and freedom. And um, um, I just mean on how cultural workers um, struggle against um, uh, the war, how they uh, find, yeah, it's here. So that, that is my first um, uh, example, um, which is um, uh, St. Petersburg. Um, as you may suggest, um, it's been, still winter there, it, it's cold. So that's, um, um, I, I know, um, um, I, I'm a sociologist of art, I'm not an art historian, so uh, I can't define genre, but, um, like if I say eyes graffiti, would it be correct? I'm, I'm not sure. So that, that's a war, uh, anti-war uh, sign uh, written on ice of one of St. Petersburg uh, canals uh, and uh, administration of the city tries to get over it. Uh, uh, tries to get it over uh, with uh, paint. So basically what they do is uh, paint eyes uh, while trying to resist this uh, powerful um, message. Uh, the other example of um, uh, process creativity is recent um, International Women's Day. Uh, it's also St. Petersburg, which is my uh, hometown, right in the city center on Nevsky Prospect. Uh, we can see, because uh, usually in a very patriarchal way, um, uh, men give uh, flowers to women, but here we can see some protesting women giving flowers to um, to police. Um, then uh, among the most direct signs of uh, struggle uh, against the Ukrainian war, um, and um, it's kind of a sad story as many others. Uh, it was a letter, uh, so here she, she can see the script, script grab. Um, uh, so there was the letter of cultural workers of Russia um, against the war, signed by more than 12,000 people. Later, uh, the letter was removed as, um, uh, as one of the organizers of the letter uh, said on uh, her Facebook, uh, like I did some um, homework for police because and, and, and for repressing cultural institutions by giving them a list of those people uh, to uh, fire uh, from their work and, and, and chase. So now uh, the list is saved uh, and um, just exists um, privately. Um, and um, um, 
my favorite example of today. And um, I am very, very proud of Marina Afsenikova, the uh, editor of um, uh, Channel One, uh, which is often called the main source of um, Putin's propaganda. So um, uh, she appeared uh, today during um, um, the news presentation uh, with this uh, poster. Uh, you can actually see that um, they lie to us, it, it's propaganda. Um, it just happened several hours uh, ago, but to me, um, she, she symbolized uh, a lot, not also because she's extremely courageous, um, brave woman I am especially proud of, but also uh, because um, uh, she worked critically with um, a distinction I uh, analyzed uh, a lot. So because I write about inequality in the arts uh, and culture um, and media, there is often happens so, so there are those cultural workers who get um, more uh, of fame, more visibility, more resources, which is um, can be an example of this um, um, TV presenter Yekaterina Andreeva and their uh, background workers or back office workers, they don't have uh, any of access. So uh, she was uh, not only demonstrating her powers uh, in protest, though it was very, very uh, dangerous and um, um, I, I, I just hope uh, she will be free soon because now she 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 detained, um, and um, um, but also she break this barrier for visibility and um, she is a powerful um, cultural worker. I would unfold it like that as well. So uh, these are examples of uh, struggle, resistance, and and protest that. Uh, clearly given and we can understand that but i would just give you um, more of a context of those struggle that are still um, situated in invisible russia and those struggles who are um, uh, more long term and um, um, ask for um, like a, a very fragile uh, fragile and uncomplicated uh, balance between what uh, cultural workers would like to do and uh, what they can in a very restricted situation of uh, cultural production um, in Russia. So um, uh, before going into that, um, I uh, do I will um, present uh, my approach. So as I mentioned already, I uh, critically work with uh, social inequality. Uh, within the arts, and uh, obviously I'm not uh, the first one who deals with um, um, that um, uh, agenda. Here you can see the list of um, uh, researchers. I would uh, particularly assign myself to a strand of research on critical uh, creative labor studies, uh, but also sociology of the arts. Um, devoted um, a lot of um, pages uh, and time to um, uh, inequalities. And as I said, um, that's a clear contrast uh, between uh, the top of the art world, the top of art pyramid, um, uh, who gets um, uh, more um, resources, and um, uh, those people who are included from um, um, uh, the distribution. But um, this model, um, which um, um, kind of, I mean, it's hard to resist <laughs> against um, uh, this model, but nevertheless, I think um, it's, um, I assume it um, to simplify and um, um, uh, in fighting with uh, inequality, um, I would recommend to um, jump from this kind of a, a binary uh, picture towards more complicated models. And um, um, so it's not just glass ceiling concepts or uh, concepts of underrepresentation of women or people of color or people of um, uh, certain um, uh, social class, but um, I would rather go for speaking for those uh, inequalities that are um, uh, performative, 
uh, that um, uh, are performed um, at certain place and time and sometimes um, are invisible in their formation. Uh, that's why I would go for um, ethnographic um, approach and um, something I, um, uh, I am developing um, um, at the moment. Uh, so uh, to see um, inequalities in the way um, the formating um, uh, as some uh, more complicated uh, interplay of um, um, uh, gender, class and um, um, other factors. So I call this approach luminescent um, ethnography given um, by giving uh, my methodology a kind of a light uh, to seek for uh, inequalities uh, in uh, cultural organizations that um, um, I would call them uh, creative ecology. Uh, creative ecologists, and uh, here I would include not only those uh, people who are um, uh, assigned, um, uh, who are recognized as um, creative workers. If we deal with cultural institutions and visual art, they, they would be artists, curators, uh, research fellows, directors, um, those people who work uh, with archive. Not just that, but I would also include in this um, creative um, ecologies um, those people who are technical workers, who are uh, cleaners, who work in clock rooms, um, and, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, by broadening this approach, I would give some recognition to non-human agents that only also represent uh, institutions as uh, plants, cats, uh, rats, bugs, um, uh, architecture, um, and, and, and so on. So I would place uh, my approach here and uh, to give you more uh, of um, uh, visual reproduction. Uh, I mean, it, it's nice to uh, bring this picture while being here in San Francisco, in, in California. One of my favorite artists, curators, a great conceptualist, Michael Escher, who um, did this um, iconic work in mid seventies in um, uh, one of um, LA uh, between uh, galleries. So what he did, he just um, removed the wall between uh, clearly uh, signed um, place for uh, exhibition like white cube for artworks and those um, um, and um, uh, the back door, uh, the office workers who are not be seen. Uh, so um, I follow this as a methodology uh, too, and uh, like a little homage to uh, Michael Esche. Um, that's something uh, every anthropologist would do um, at, um, at some point. That is me at um, a back door of one of um, cultural um, institutions uh, um, in Moscow. and. Um, uh, I find it very interesting because, um, I mean, I can't name the institution, but uh, trust me, you won't never, uh, you would never recognize this institution uh, from um, this point of view because you can't see beautiful uh, architecture of those, you can't see smiley uh, gallery assistants instead of it, you can see like uh, cheap affordable furniture, um, security, I mean here you can't see it, but believe me they're there, uh, security guards uh, having a nap on an old sofa, uh, many workers of technical department who are migrants from Middle Asia. So I would give uh, a light to this picture to have more systematic uh, view on inequality and the, in the arts and the, the ways of resistance uh, connected uh, to that. So now um, 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 I want us to move um, uh, to Moscow for uh, my first example. Um, and um, this is um, um, a timeline 
I would present that are already uh, incomplete. So they are um, uh, private and public uh, cultural institutions that appeared in Moscow alone uh, since um, the 90s. And uh, of course, um, um, a great shift happened uh, in um, uh, 1991 after the uh, collapse of uh, Soviet Union. Before, as you know, uh, contemporary art was mostly uh, prohibited and existed in the um, deep underground. So seeing that uh, contemporary art scene boomed uh, and um, uh, uh, um, especially um, I would focus here on those institutions that became available that opened uh, in um, 2000s. Uh, many of them are private and many of them very dissimilar with what would you uh, imagine um, as a classical um, uh, fine art uh, museum uh, in, in Russia. And um, um, uh, I am sorry that you um, kind of limited duration of my talk today. Um, I can bring you many of those examples who um, uh, which are not from Moscow, but believe me, there are many, many of self-organized art center and something that would uh, we would call top-down uh, institutions. Uh, they are they exist in in uh, Novosibirsk, in Yekaterinburg, in Saint Petersburg, and uh, Kaliningrad, and there are many many of those, and there are very uh, many enthusiastic uh, cultural workers uh, who um, sometimes do impossible things to make um, the institutions um, running. So I would just give you, for those of you who didn't have a chance to visit, I would just give you some um, visual examples of uh, what are this place. So that's kind of a, a collage. Uh, and uh, here I would just go one by one. So this is, um, uh, Garage Museum that was open in the center of um, Moscow. They changed the building since uh, then. It was open in Vikhmetivsky Garage. And those of you who like Zigovertov might uh, remember this from opening scenes from Man with a Movie Camera. So now uh, they located in this new building, uh, which is Soviet restaurant from uh, the 60s, like modernist building redesigned by Brim Kulhas. Um, the next one would be Strelka Institute for Urban uh, Design and Planning, also located in the center of Moscow at uh, one of the islands. Um, I mean, uh, it was important to mention that um, Garage is located in um, um, Gorky Park. Um, here it's an island, uh, Baltic island in the center of, of Moscow, that's their place for open lectures. And um, um, the, the, the newest one uh, was opened um, in uh, December uh, last year and um, uh, a bit similar to Tate Modern in London. To me, that's a form of uh, electricity station. And here you can see the public art uh, commission, which was um, discussed many, many times within um, uh, different opportunities of uh, public debate, because um, a lot of people didn't like it um, in the center of uh, Moscow. Uh, so here, those photographs are made by me during um, uh, the visit. Um, uh, here you can see um, the recent project opened there, which is uh, Santa Barbara by Ragnar Kjartison, Icelandic artist who had to stop um, his project uh, because of um, uh, disagreement with, um, as he said, Nazi uh, politics of um, Vladimir Putin. And um, um, currently um, the exhibition space, actually all three, they stopped or restricted the um, public activities. So uh, what I did during my ethnographic uh, project that took me um, some years, um, um, I was there with cultural workers. Um, I interviewed uh, all together about 50 of them, uh, not, to, uh, not in Moscow alone, but uh, in St. Petersburg um, as well. Then I went to London and, and uh, did a comparison, but this part I won't touch during um, the show talk. 
Um, uh, also, I did many of uh, observations. With, with some of them, I became uh, like a very good friend and um, they let me stay with them in their offices and um, uh, witness and sometimes um, a little bit assist with their hard work, which uh, sometimes took them for more than um, 14, 16 hours. Some of them spent nights uh, at um, their cultural institution. So let me just give them some voice and um, uh, share their perspectives on um, uh, the cultural work uh, they uh, implement. Um, to me, uh, it's very interesting that, uh, and even a bit confusing that despite uh, hard working conditions they have, they're very, very loyal and uh, I'm proud of uh, those institutions uh, they've been running together and within the tradition of uh, Soviet uh, collective labor, uh, I would say they, they sacrifice a lot uh, um, of their lifetime, of uh, their talents and uh, creative effort they invested um, uh, in the institution. So uh, here you can see the bunch of quotes uh, from my uh, interviewees showing um, their respect and loyalty uh, to um, the institution. They, they find not only cool workplace, but also in a way um, their home. Um, and um, uh, for many of those, uh, when I analyzed uh, my um, interview archive, I noticed that the line of uh, giving special metaphors uh, to um, those institutions. And um, uh, on the one hand, there is no wonder. They call it like them um, as oasis or uh, islands or microstate, um, because uh, most of them, they are um, um, uh, located at islands. Um, in uh, parks, um, or uh, they're part of um, um, gentrification and their former um, factories, so not many things are connected or close to this institution. So that's a kind of um, contract, uh, contrast between the rest of uh, urban environment and uh, the institution themselves. Um, and uh, Marina Bravovich here, um, is to confirm what she says here. Um, uh, it's it's given in in Russian. The um, it, it's a promotional video for uh, Garage Museum. So what she says that uh, Garage Museum is unique island of uh, contemporary art um, in Moscow. So I started to uh, unfold uh, this metaphor. Um, and um, uh, to me, uh, that was very interesting. Like, why do they use uh, this particular way of uh, describing um, their jobs? Because I would say that not everybody would say, like, I work on, on an island or oasis or uh, mirage, or uh, that one I particularly enjoy um, a piece of Europe uh, in Russia. That because uh, those uh, places which are actually gated communities uh, and most of them they have uh, security guards um, at their entrance. So they check the visitors, they, um, um, uh, they may exclude some um, social groups. Um, they give more um, filtered um, and um, um, at this one, at one, one uh, on the, the one side, uh, they give more filtered uh, audience, so um, a lot of people can't access these places. But on the other hand, um, they give um, some um, safe um, place to the workers and some of the visitors. Um, they secure uh, the borders, like physical borders and, and uh, uh, boundaries uh, of um, their lifestyle, uh, which is, um, I mean, I keep critical about that pretty much um, middle class, uh, but together with that, um, they, uh, in this um, oasis, they um, can perform their multiple identities they have more openly 
than um, in uh, the rest of Russia. Um, first, I mean, um, gender identity that can be different than the, um, uh, the, the majority or, or domination, dominated ways of to perform uh, gender, to be a um, woman or man or um, a non-binary person uh, and, um, um, uh, and, and sexual identities. So I think that despite um, the limitations um, I described, uh, this island, their safe space for uh, cultural workers, uh, they feel uh, they belong to and um, um, they invest uh, um, their dreams, their prospects uh, to future um, in it. Uh, and uh, as I said, many, many talents um, uh, they have. And um, um, I already started to discuss um, the meaning of um, uh, government, um, which seems, um, uh, of course, um, one thing I, I should be mentioned um, before is that um, most of um, creative economy in Russia is controlled um, by uh, the government because many of institutions, they are state funded and, um, um, but not only, legally it's also uh, controlled because for instance, what to create a museum that will be legally defined as a museum, an institution should uh, be following uh, many rules. But in this unique oasis, um, workers and visitors, but mostly workers feel that um, there is less uh, of uh, control and there is uh, less government and they feel they are out of Russia. So I would say that that spaces of pretty much um, negotiated and uh, restricted freedom, but still they are, or they hope places um, of freedom, which um, now can just um, disappear. So it's like a very limited opportunity to create and basically breathe for uh, these uh, cultural workers. But that's an interesting paradox that uh, by excluding um, state, uh, the cultural workers um, also exclude um, welfare state, like um, uh, their work, um, the guarantees for their working contract, and they don't really follow the contract that um, can be sometimes uh, pretty good formulated because they find uh, them and their employees being on the same side, safe in uh, creating this safe space uh, from the state and, and from um, the government. So um, if um, a, 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 a working um, uh, conflict uh, appears, um, these cultural workers who um, as I said before, uh, overwork, um, who are sometimes uh, invisible, in many cases invisible and um, excluded, some of them um, discriminated, um, they can't um, uh, fight for their rights, these legal terms, uh, because they, want, they don't want the government to be um, involved uh, in the struggle or uh, this quotation um, I would find um, pretty much clear and um, uh, illustrative as one of the curators said, I don't need cops um, as um, labor police um, in my house. Um, and that's how they would call uh, institution. So um, they, uh, being in this institution, being part of their teams, um, they, as I said, sacrifice a lot of their lifetime, of their um, resources. Many of them, they don't have um, families or um, an opportunity to um, start um, a family uh, financially and because they, they, they sacrifice that much in terms of um, their lifetime. Uh, but also they don't have um, a way out of um, sometimes very toxic um, labor relations. 
So um, that was um, one of the examples. And uh, now uh, I hope we're still good with timing. So now I would uh, move to my other example because um, that's a major part of um, my work. Uh, it was devoted to cultural institutions, but I don't want to limit our vision of um, uh, Russian culture by only uh, saying that, uh, of course, um, the, the place of culture and understanding of culture is very contested in Russia, and by, by saying culture, we still see it uh, in a very narrow way. Um, excluding um, a lot of vividly developing scenes. And I, I highly recommend to um, give a look at um, uh, work of Natalia Samutina, who uh, wrote about um, many phenomena that um, excluded from um, uh, popular visions of Russian culture as um, uh, Japanese manga in Russia as fan fiction writers, community, especially uh, female writers of fan fiction, um, graffiti scene, and, and so on. But um, I, today I want to bring um, another case because today um, is a very special and, and um, um, upsetting date, though I think it, it's a historical day today. So today, Russia blocks uh, Instagram um, uh, as an extremist uh, organization. And um, sorry, it's in Russian, but um, it's authentic. So that's a screen grab from my email box uh, that was sent to me and every user of the website called Gososlugi, which is like in literal uh, translation would be state service. So it's kind of e-government um, uh, website. So here they state that um, Instagram uh, will be blocked um, in Russia. Um, Interestingly, there are some issues with um, um, putting some uh, dots or exclamation points or any syntaxes, but nevertheless, so what they say that um, Instagram um, uh, administration um, prohibits international law uh, first in, in history um, and um, uh, calls for violence uh, towards uh, citizens um, of Russia. That's why um, um, uh, Russia decided to ban, to prohibit um, Instagram. Um, and um, I can still hardly believe uh, in this fact, but nevertheless, uh, it's happening and it's happening today. So that's why especially I want to devote some place and um, give some space and time uh, in my talk to um, Russian Instagram, which is huge. So there is um, some statistic uh, given by a private company, uh, Statista. So there are 69 uh, million users of um, uh, Instagram in Russia. And um, uh, as you can see on this graph, the um, young people um, uh, just um, a, a very low percentage of uh, teenagers. More than that, they um, are uh, people, um, young people and um, middle-aged people. And um, uh, then we have um, uh, not that many users um, after 50. Uh, here you can see some percentage for those people who over um, uh, 65, they're probably my parents <laughs> in the 70s who both, um, both of them, the active um, uh, Instagram users. So Instagram uh, is a huge part uh, of uh, digital life um, in Russia. And um, um, I would just um, uh, put some um, perspective of um, uh, my good colleague, um, um, Ellen Rutten from um, uh, uh, University of Amsterdam, who extensively uh, writes on uh, imperfection uh, in culture and um, uh, imperfection plays important role in Russian culture as well. 
but uh, I would say that uh, given a gaze to perfection is uh, extremely important for um, users of Russian Instagram uh, to switch and to um, live um, in a different reality, which is um, a sort uh, of, of so someone may call escapism, but I just would say that uh, something that would augment um, reality in living uh, um, in um, uh, many cities uh, of, of Russia. So, and many users, they would travel via Instagram. Um, they would create um, the alternative and digital selves as probably many users worldwide. So um, that was a very uh, significant uh, phenomenon. Uh, in, in Russia, but here I would question, like, when we say um, Russian uh, Instagram, what do we mean um, in particular? And uh, here I would um, bring an example of one of the most popular bloggers, uh, first on uh, Instagram, but also on uh, YouTube and TikTok. So um, um, Alexander Dmitrienka, who is um, more known as um, Shura Stone or Pohitila Ramadov, uh, possibly we can um, translate that as a perfume thief. Um, so together for these three platforms, I think um, he's got more than um, one million um, followers uh, at least. And uh, the story of um, Alexander um, is, um, I would say, very unusual, but uh, illustrates uh, many places uh, and multi um, ideas of multi presence uh, of um, uh, Russian Instagram in particular. So, Alexander was born um, uh, in Kyiv and um, uh, now based um, uh, in UK, and he lives there for many years. Though uh, his main audience, uh, he speaks Russian with his followers, and um, uh, his main audience uh, in Russian is Russian. Uh, and what he uh, develops, um, there are multiple of formats, but mostly uh, he does uh, drag culture, and um, um, uh, one of the most popular characters he impersonates uh, is uh, Shura Stone, who um, is an employee of um, a, a supermarket in, in Russia. That's a chain called uh, Pitorechka, um, kind of 7-Eleven, um, if we would put it in the um, American uh context so she's got a very traditional family she's got a husband and she's a mother of a um, um, teenage boy so here um, I would present uh, I hope the video will work um, uh, like a summary of uh, Alexander's creativity which is not just sure stone but also um, uh, many other characters um, yeah, so that's, that's his Instagram profile, um, if you want to follow, and uh, I just hope that video uh, would work. Oh yeah, it's downloading. So that was um, um, his uh, original 
voice, which is popular for voicing um, cats and their uneasy uh, behavior. And uh, he also does a lot of um, queer dancing on um, uh, TikTok. And now I just want to um, get back to my next slide. Um, yeah which is um, here. And uh, for those of you who will be able uh, to follow Alexandra um, on uh, YouTube and uh, look a bit more into uh, the show he runs at uh, Shore Stone, um, you can uh, possibly see very careful work of um, uh, reproducing um, again, kind of an invisible worker of um, a Russian supermarket, though uh, Alexander, um, I interviewed him and um, uh, he was in Russia just um, one day. So with this um, uh, given context, the visual context, um, he fantasized about possible living, um, ways of living of uh, women uh, in Russia. And uh, uh, in his UK apartment, he basically reproduced um, a Russian uh, supermarket. You can see that the handwritten uh, logo. He uses pounds as uh, rubles. And um, with Instagram and uh, YouTube, Alexander um, travels uh, within Russia. He found himself to be part of, though um, never been um, in, um, in the given context um, um, himself. Uh, as um, um, one of the examples, I would just bring his um, uh, uh, Instagram uh, account where, um, um, well, he says something, he just sends greetings that his popular uh, phrase to girls, boys, and um, non-binary persons, which sounds very, very advanced for a top blogger in um, Russian YouTube and Instagram. And here with um, um, Geotech, um, you can see um, uh, that he is located um, in imaginary um, Nizhny Novgorod, which is a um, central part of Russia, though obviously here uh, he is depicted being um, in the UK, um, in London. So, and with this uh, very extravagant um, queer perspective, I just want to put the importance of uh, um, horizontal collaboration between uh, many of uh, Russian, uh, Ukrainian, and bloggers and um, uh, representatives of other ways of um, cultural labor, though physically uh, not many of those um, saw each other. Uh, and um, uh, one of, um, um, I just uh, think that I need to finish soon and this example um, I don't want to give fully, but one of my work uh, was a um, team of uh, translators for um, a TV series, uh, pretty much self-organized uh, collectives that existed uh, not in, they, they spoke in Russian language, but they existed not in Russia alone, but many of them, the uh, teams working simultaneously in Ukraine, um, in uh, Kazakhstan, in Belarus, uh, in Russia, uh, never been present together in one place, uh, but working as a team for, for uh, disseminating um, their, their collective um, uh, result in, in translating culture. Um, most of the um, TV series, Western TV series or American TV series were actually uh, translated um, in that very um, collaborative way. Um, so with this example, I think um, just, um, oh yeah, um, 
yeah, I've been speaking a lot. Um, I'm, I, I need to finish. Um, there is one more beautiful image of uh, Alexander who plays in, uh, who recreates um, Russian or Ukrainian or, or any kind of uh, post-Soviet uh, market. Um, and he plays uh, a seller of um, shoes. Um, within, I think I'll finish and then that's us uh, together while our joint performance in uh, London and Pushkin House. And um, uh, I know that Q&A session uh, will follow, but uh, please uh, keep in touch. That's my website with all the contact details, but mostly let's be in touch uh, on Instagram and let's keep Instagram alive. Um, the, um, it's not a publication, but my very good colleague, um, Lev Manovich, but his um, Instagram post, I would put quotation on, um, he said that uh, if someone would block Instagram, unbelievably, as a um, political organization, uh, as an extremist organization, which is shocking, that still means that uh, Instagram and um, the words we co-create there, they're still uh, very important and influential. So let's just keep those places as Instagram running together. That would be all. Thank you. And um, again, uh, this war needs to be stopped. Um, I stand with solidarity with Ukraine. Oh, I need to, I need to stop sharing my presentation. Okay, I'm gonna face you <laughs> since we're in the same room. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, you know, we had talked before this uh, lecture about perhaps you being willing to share some of your experiences um, in Russia over the past three weeks. So uh, however you want to talk about that, I think our audience would be really interested. Uh, and by the way, please put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll select a couple of questions for Rita in a moment, but um, if you could please you know, describe how has it been um, observing what's been unfolding uh, mm. first in St. Petersburg, and then also you had a, such difficulty leaving the country too. So anything you want to share about the last three weeks, I think um, would really be enlightening for our audience. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I'm um, ready to share. So um, for me, that's, um, I mean, as I said, that, that that's hard time for me because of um, many reasons connected to this war, but also very interesting time because that's my second time, second trip um, in the, uh, to the US. And um, um, like most uh, of the time of the war, um, I actually spent here. So I think I left on the sixth day of war. And um, um, we tried really hard. And again, I'm grateful pretty much to um, Berkeley Center for uh, New Media for, for making it uh, possible uh, because um, it, it was a, a very, very stressful period. And um, um, I mean, like as many of my colleagues and friends, um, I feel, um, I felt and feel, um, like being, it's, it's a difficult time for us because um, I think locked would be um, the key concept. First, um, I felt locked in uh, my own country because for me, uh, bringing international experience, and I would say for uh, my university, uh, it was one of the um, key uh, points to, to connect 
and uh, actually uh, to be connected. And uh, my work was pretty much associated with um, um, international uh, creative labor for many, many years. And uh, in one week, I first uh, realized that all of us, we are losing these opportunities. Um, secondly, I realized that um, my work uh, is ruined, that work for me, mine, uh, of mine and uh, my colleagues for many, year, many years. Um, it just disappeared because when uh, we say Russia, uh, we associated with uh, violent militant uh, uh, behavior, though uh, all the networks, all the artworks, all the cooperation uh, we tried to create for these many years. And uh, I mean, like maybe I'm 35, so maybe less uh, of me, but I would, I would actually extend that to the whole uh, post-Soviet period and, and perestroika, it just disappeared at once. Uh, so that one thing, like how it's ruined and locked, uh, the other thing is um, just a very conflicting uh, understanding of self for many people who are representatives of uh, Russian intelligent intelligentsia. I would say that uh, something we would call um, um, a culture, the culture of shame appeared because um, a lot of people shared uh, personal guilty and uh, on Facebook, uh, when it still existed uh, in Russia, like multiple postings of um, colleagues in France, they all said the same, like um, I am guilty uh, and um, I, I don't know how to express this shame and um, uh, feeling of, of guilt. And uh, I would say that uh, all educated class in, in Russia, they find themselves in this situation of, um, I would just say self-harm. And they were postings like, um, uh, it's really hard to uh, live these spring days because they are so sunny. And I feel guilty if I just enjoy good lunch, good coffee. Uh, sunny day. So um, um, emotionally, um, I mean, um, it was and is um, a devastating situation. And of course, the priority is stop fire to get the troops out of uh, Ukraine. But um, uh, it's trauma for, uh, I think, for all Russian people. It's just some uh, recognize it, some not. But I, I, I would say it's been, it will be with us, not just one generation, but may, maybe mainly many generations. So, and uh, that's a question how um, we can work with that because uh, clearly um, that's um, a lot of work and um, um, that the conditions are, and perspectives, they are um, um, impossible. Um, and um, I would just say one more word about uh, being here. So um, actually, again, I'm uh, very happy um, I could make it. And um, also, I would say that many people I knew in the US before, and some people that I just met, they were very sympathetic and, and friendly to me, but this condition um, is very new when you just like, we have a chat, um, like a small talk with someone and this person asks like, where are you from? Where are you traveling to? Like, what did you hear? And uh, you say, I'm Russian. And it's not just uh, like, uh, like it used to be like saying, oh, I'm German, I'm Italian, I'm Bolivian, but it's, it's a start uh, of a conversation. Um, so, and um, I mean, like um, 
always uh, when I have this conversation, I share um, my position. I think it's important and I think um, it's a privilege to be here to have personal dialogues uh, with those people who are interested. But I would say that uh, many people were very friendly to me. And uh, because, um, as I said before, I feel like I am traumatized. Um, that's, uh, and that, that's not the country I live in. And I don't know how other people uh, see myself being here. But it, it gives a lot of support and um, willingness to talk to create, to continue my work, despite, like in Russia, it basically feels like the end of the world. Uh, there's no future and um, given perspectives. So it gives support, gives a lot in this time. Yeah, and I think, you know, another thing, another uh, way we were talking today about what it has been like for Russians over the past several weeks is that I said Americans, um, Americans in the past, you know, when this country has occupied other nations, which has happened many times, mm -hmm. um, that Americans don't feel that guilt, I think. I mean, I think sometimes Americans have felt shame. And certainly there were times, especially under the previous presidential administration, mm -hmm. when um, Americans I knew would sort of pass as, you know, Canadian mm -hmm. or something. I think that's been a temptation in the past to not own their Americanness when they travel. But I don't think that, um, well, because the U.S. is, uh, it's hard for other nations to sanction the U.S. when the U.S. invades other countries, you know. And mm -hmm. so even when this country has occupied other countries, um, it doesn't feel like the end of the world here. So I think that there's, there is something, there's a way that a, uh, as an American, I can sympathize with Russians right now mm -hmm. as residents of the invading nation and being against the mm -hmm. war. And in fact, you know, um, I like millions of Americans marched under exactly the same slogan, not in my name. Mm -hmm. Not in our name was the was the major slogan mm -hmm. for anti-war protesters um, when the Bush administration invaded Iraq, and so um, I really feel you know with the the Russian populace at this mm -hmm. time, but also acknowledging it's very different uh, because of the sanctions. Uh, okay, we have uh, I of course I have more questions, but uh, let me ask a question from the uh, from the audience. Um, Dalida asks, how can international networks of cultural and educational institutions support dissident Russian artists and scholars, as well as Ukrainian refugee artists and scholars? Uh, and what does this current moment open up for understanding the importance of support for other refugee and exile communities of scholars and artists? Uh, what are the commonalities of the global precarities that result in our slash your traumas? Well, that's a lot of fantastic questions from uh, Dalida. Thank you. Thank you, Dalida, who is um, a very good friend and, 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 and colleague. And uh, we've worked together, um, together with Dalida and um, uh, many other people, very, very international uh, team of uh, Center for Design, Arts and Social Research. Um, I mean, that, that's a very important question um, because um, uh, first, the situation is unfolding just right now. So we just started, but the, um, some of outcomes that are visible. So there are many initiatives uh, to support um, Ukrainian artists and, and scholars. Uh, and um, um, I've seen a, a lot of people actually send um, um, some announcements to me. So with those Ukrainian scholars and uh, artists, uh, I know I shared it uh, with them. So their scholarships and, and so on. 
uh, for um, Russian um, uh, cultural and academic workers, I would say that's a kind of ambivalency. Um, some institutions would uh, ban uh, Russian scholars and um, exclude them from um, their networks. And um, some of my colleagues received these mails that based uh, on um, your citizenship, we would exclude you at the moment. Some joint projects with Russia stopped. So um, many international institutions, um, they left Russia and that's a very, very sad outcome. And uh, uh, that's a lot of work um, in, in, in the future. And um, um, uh, I mean, that's a very interesting question about um, uh, refugee artists uh, and, and, and scholars, um, um, yeah, and uh, because um, these uh, communities, they just been uh, in formation and uh, me personally, um, what I see is um, a lot of people who in, in many situations, in many countries, or like we were not that close, but they 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 in touch, and um, uh, more of um, uh, solidarity. So um, just some of my colleagues from Saint Petersburg, some of them in Mexico, um, some of them uh, in China, actually, and uh, many of them um, in Georgia and Armenia, um, and um, yeah, it's interesting how the art scene. Um, goes, I mean, it's a forced mobilization, but it, it goes global in some um, unpredictable way. Um, the support for other refugees and the uh, current moment open, mm -hmm. the important support for other refugees and exile communities of artists um, uh, and, and scholars. Um, I think. Um, that also um, um, an important theme for uh, the future. Now uh, the main feelings would be shock, and um, 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 I mean it's, it's it, as I said three times today. I think it, it, it it's hard to talk literally and and metaphorically. It's hard to um, present yourself, um, and um, I mean what. Like, should I should I present myself as an international scholar, as, as a Russian scholar? Do I have uh, the right to create? Do I have the right to talk at the moment during uh, military action? Uh, would other people want to hear uh, what I do? They are all open uh, questions and. Um, um, I mean, of course, uh, that's another step uh, towards uh, precarity. And um, I, I know how um, detailed I gave um, uh, the picture and what you know already, but I would just say that, um, I mean, it's been very precarious um, Russian, Russian cultural scene and it's like losing opportunities. I think it just, I mean, Russia is about to uh, lose its culture because I mean, like um, what will be the, vo the voices of um, um, people who immigrated or who just left for a while? I mean, would they, they speak for, for, for Russia? And of course, um, I mean, that that's in, in here more dialogue with other communities um, definitely needed. And I hope we can um, try to work it through uh, together, but I mean, uh, in historical scale, it gives uh, so many opportunities for uh, understanding. Like uh, recently, thanks to my dear friends, I was able to visit uh, Walter Gropius house um, near Boston. And um, uh, so um, as you remember, Walter Gropius um, had to um, leave um, Nazi Germany. He had to run. Uh, he escaped first to the UK and then to um, US. 
and um, he found like new foundations for um, his design and um, um, architecture. And uh, I was there listening to the story and uh, I thought like, I mean, like water group is, I do understand kind of what, 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 what you felt. Uh, and um, like, what does it make to, 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 to find yourself in these uh, desperate uh, conditions, losing um, um, losing home, and uh, even more importantly, using um, losing cultural identity. So yeah, that's um, yeah. I think that there are many many important questions for the future. I would just state like that. Yeah, and um, in addition to the specific. Um, you know, the really particular situation that Russians are in today, I think we will see, unfortunately, many, many more refugee and exile communities of, of scholars mm -hmm. and artists um, just because of climate change. So in the next 50 years, I do think we will anticipate these questions of cultural preservation, you know, transnational sorts of cooperations um, to keep institutions alive um, and this question of culture surviving great um, great change massive earth shake earth shaking changes um, I think will grow I think this question will grow in the coming decades so it is important that we begin to work on these questions now um, because they will only become more important and more frequent so um, unfortunately there is more uh, there are more ways that your talk is so relevant today Rita because mm -hmm. Um, I believe um, just yesterday, uh, Saturday afternoon, rather, um, you know, your work is on, you know, cultural institution employees. Mm -hmm. And on Saturday, two employees of MoMA in New York were stabbed very seriously by a guest, you know, by a would-be guest who was refused entrance. And um, their stab wounds were very serious that both of the employees were 24, are 24 years old. Um, one was a woman and one was a man. The woman um, suffered two stab wounds to the lower back and one wound to the back of her neck. And the man was stabbed once in his left collarbone. And they are expected to survive, but um, you know, it is shocking and horrifying. And one thing that has been discussed on sort of art Twitter today mm -hmm. is how precarious, literally vulnerable museum workers are to the public. Um, and there have been, you know, museum employees and former museum employees talking about the conditions in which if they are touched or harassed by the guests, you know, by the visitors to the museum, the museum mm -hmm. doesn't protect them because um, they don't, they see them as part of the exhibition to some extent. So they're, you know, part of what the visitors buy tickets to are the staff, but the staff have really, um, have really emotional, you know, reactions to having their personal space be invaded. And of course, if anything dangerous happens. Um, and then, you know, one thing that some people have been saying on our Twitter is, how the visceral emotional reactions of people to art um, cannot be taken out on the art. Um, the art has to be left alone. It has to be untouched. But there are people in the space who can be touched, uh, you know, the, who are the employees. So I think this is uncannily, you know, relevant mm -hmm. to uh, some of the issues that you've brought to light today, this luminescent um, ethnography. So I just wanted to hear if you had any thoughts about, um, mm. yeah, the MoMA, the, the violent MoMA incident. I mean, yes, thank you for, for bringing this to the table. And uh, I mean, honestly, because I was so um, into um, the Ukraine uh, news feed, um, I, I, I read a lot of Telegram channels, this, this news, uh, which are, um, Sad, uh, I missed, and um, um, I mean that that's that's an upsetting event, clearly. And uh, 
shows uh, risks. And uh, this risk, I would say, uh, they, um, um, they're not um, um, like the, the most frequent risk, but um, that, of course, uh, that's a, um, an interesting case to um, discuss uh, and to um, speculate on. Um, and uh, yes, of course, there are um, a lot of risks uh, connected with um, uh, the fact they're front row workers and they need to secure the, the institution and um, um, they, um, in a way, um, um, they, they have some responsibility to share for the security uh, of artworks uh, that are priceless. And um, I think that that puts a lot of um, uh, responsibility for uh, these very, very little um, uh, resources against they, they can access. So that is a problem. And um, of course, uh, I mean, it's not about uh, life threats, but um, in, in many cases, um, um, I would say that museum workers, they are in between uh, two flames. So uh, first, uh, it's precarity and risk I uh, devoted my talk to. They, they can't really talk about because they secure the institution. So um, um, they need to always uh, be coordinated with an institution so they can't criticize it uh, because they are the main adapts. So that's one trap. The second one is um, there is in the, uh, I know how um, uh, it considers, uh, it concerns um, the American art community, but what I know about Russian and European communities is that there is always assumption that um, artists, they are the precariat. And those people who have full-time jobs in museums, they are kind of fat cats of uh, art world. Um, so um, um, that's actually a question. So again, they can't speak uh, against their own institution. Then they, they can't openly criticize. Uh, so, but there can be not too many solidarities created with uh, artists because artists would say that they are in better conditions and they are more privileged, which is um, absolutely, not true. So um, that that's a group that uh, basically can't speak out. Uh, so that that's another risk. Uh, but um, um, I mean, I always find um, um, internationally um, concerned studies when we can compare context um, uh, very rewarding and uh, here I would bring um, Russian context or, or Soviet context with, um, those people usually just symbolically they have um, a lot of power and um, uh, that's a kind of a very clear way to work uh, to play with museum hierarchies um, because, uh, and, they are at the so uh, Okay, so you were talking about the, the okay, so I mean, 
Okay, great. So we were talking about uh, maybe it's just a closing thought. Yeah. The uh, the older women who work in Russian museums, yeah. who uh, even though they have such low power, oh, you have to yeah, you, uh, see themselves as the queens of the museums yeah. and feel really empowered to direct action in the museum too. Yeah, yeah. So that that approach uh, they used to fight for their own rights and i think sometimes they can be as good to museum directors mm -hmm. just just because they feel they deserve more i mean this work is not rewarded financially mm -hmm. very much uh, though they um, in many cases they have open-end contracts mm -hmm. which is very good in our world and uh, i think that they feel themselves good mm -hmm. they are their little own crowds and uh, they spend a lot of time together. Um, I mean, I would um, research it closely that that uh, example that uh, gives me much uh, perspectives uh, theoretically. So uh, yeah, and uh, because I also do performance art sometimes, uh, I would create it as a performance. I want to recreate the character in a, a context that is far from post-Soviet. So imagine that that woman who would just be in an American or, or British museum shouting at the visitors. Yes. <laughs> I've been <laughs> shown the agency. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, okay, well, I think that's all we have time for. Uh, of course, you and I will continue the conversation yeah, uh, later, uh, but uh, please um, join me from wherever you are in thanking uh, Professor Kulova for joining us and thank you all so much. And to those of you who may watch in the future, watching the recording in the future, thank you so much for, uh, for coming tonight and yeah. Um, Peace to the world and solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you. And keep in touch. <laughs>